Hello, my name is uh, Brian Owen with Photonic Health, and we're here for another Health Made Simple. We have a very special guest this weekend, this week that uh, we met down at the Ohio Equine Affair. Her name is Dr. Melanie Wirth, and she's very proficient in horse supplement, animal supplement, and also red light therapy, which just blew my mind. How are you doing today, Melanie? I'm doing great. Would you like to give a little background of yourself, of your experiences, and how you went through red light therapy and the supplements, and how you moved on? Sure, I can get, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. I we got uh, plenty of time. Don't worry. Okay, uh, my background is equine nutrition. Um, I did a PhD at Doctor Virginia Tech on equine nutrition and exercise physiology, and I I'm an active rider and competitor of um, used to be event and now dressage horses. Okay. And that's really where I got into photonic therapy was uh, maintaining my horses and their well-being and their soundness. And um, I started out actually with lasers, which is the, the full thing. And yeah. then um, obviously that was a part of the uh, red light was part of the laser therapy, which we use to treat wounds, deal with injuries. Mm -hmm. You know, pain alleviation, that kind of thing in the horses. And since it works so well on the horses, of course, I do myself and yeah. I did my dog. And I don't do laser or photonic therapy professionally. It's just done personally, yeah. you know, for my own horses um, and for the horses in my care. Yeah, most of our users are using them for themselves, for their own animals anyway. And do you find that most of the time people are coming to you because they get into horses and then all of a sudden they go, oh, my gosh, well, tell me about this whole world of supplementing because everybody in the world thinks they know how a horse should be fed and they know how a horse should be supplemented and cared for. And you should have a chiropractor, you should have uh, a massage therapist and somebody doing animal communication. And, you know, and all the things that we find out is that typically there's either pain, emotion or they're just not getting the right nutrition? Um, it can be all of the above. Um, they usually come to me because they're running into a problem. Yes. Um, the horse is misbehaving. The horse is not healthy. The horse has some issue. And, um, you know, they've been feeding it whatever they've been feeding it, and then they will uh, run into this problem, and then they will come and ask, you know, for help. And we take a look and we make suggestions and and you know, other ways to do it. But yes, it's usually a case of when the horse is running into a problem. And it can be any of those behavioral comfort, you know, this kind of thing. And sure. sometimes it's for enhanced uh, performance um, maintenance. Uh, we won't say enhancement, but most of the horses I'm dealing with are high performance horses. So there's a fair demand on them physically. And yes. people, of course, want to keep them as happy and as healthy and as good as they can. They have a vested interest, shall we say. Yeah. So, you know, I'm also an advanced equine podiatrist. So, you know, first thing I always ask is, what is the environment this horse is going to be using? And what is expected of them of what they're going to be doing? Because that puts all of us in the right position frame mind of what we need to tell those people um, on what they need to be doing. Exactly. So you need to know, you know, how is it living? Um, what is it supposed to do? What is your desire for it to do? And then where are the are the shortcomings? Yeah, because I, um, I don't know, you'll probably, you, maybe you'll agree with me, but I find the most problem with most horses is they're either over supplemented, overfed, or they're, they're in a stress environment due to domestication where, you know, they're waiting for that five o'clock bell to go off to get their feed or they're sitting in a stall and going crazy because they're looking at the outside from the inside out. Well, yes, all of that. Um, some horses are overfed and over supplemented. Some are not. You know, there's a lot of variation. Um, but they, we tend to keep horses in stalls for our convenience. We mm -hmm. I point out it's very rarely for the horse's convenience. Um, we want them there when we want to ride them. We don't want to have to go traipsing out to the pasture to coach them. So we put them in a box and we keep them there. And then it's easy and convenient. And then you run into some where people keep a horse in because it keeps it clean. You know, mm -hmm. they don't want to have to brush it and, or they don't have to clean it too much. But, um, you know, we always talk about the three F's of horse happiness, you know, friends, freedom and forage. Um, so they are much better if they have movement. They, they need to move. 
Yes. Um, they're better if they get uh, friends to talk to, and that's another problem with putting them in stalls. They're on their own. They're not uh, interacting with other horses, um, although the interactions are not always beneficial. <laughs> I've had a number of horses who get, get called because they went out with their buddy and they had a discussion and someone got kicked. Um, and then you have, you know, the, the the feeding situation, which is, you know, horses really are forage digesters and they do much better if they're on hay and just what they need by way of extras over the hay and not excess. Yes. And that can be very hard because if they love their horse, they want to feed it. And so, you know, sweet feed smells great and they want to put all this molasses-based stuff in a bucket and give it to the horse. And, of course, the horse likes it. So the horse is whinnying and excited and they think that's a great thing. And it's like "Mm, it's like giving a kid a donut or a candy bar. It's like McDonald's every day. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. You want to do this occasionally, but you really don't want to do this on a a twice daily basis. Right. Right. Um, and then I, that's one point I wanted to talk to you about a little bit. I'm sure that a lot of what you get, depending depending on what part of the country you're from. I know when we used to live in Wisconsin, we fed differently and supplemented differently than we do down in Florida because you want a cooling food versus a warming food. And you want uh, maybe I don't know if you ever go down that, that track or not. Or But a lot of times it is stomach related as far as what the horse needs to do because they're burning more calories up north than they do down south, although they're sweating like crazy down here. Right. There's, there is a lot of difference in um, geography, um, it, climate, soil type, vegetation, what they get access to, what the haze are that you can get that are grown locally. Um, and of course, the quality of the um, the soil that it's grown in. But yeah. yeah, there's a big difference between the horses up in the cold north, where they're you know having to keep generate body heat, and then the horse down in Florida where it's sweating and it's you know right. losing all its electrolytes in sweat. So we, you do. That's one of the questions we ask people: is where are you? Exactly. Um, you know that does make a big difference. Yeah, because no two horses are the same. No two environments are the same. And it can be different even 200 miles or 100 miles. I mean, from where we are in central Ocala to even people in Jacksonville have a whole different world. They're they're much more wet than we are. Um, we have less humidity than what they have, even though we're more south. But we're in a small part of the state where we don't get as humid as what they do. Well, Ocala is probably the best place in Florida to re- be raising and keeping horses for sure. It's yeah. even worse when you get down to West Palm Beach. And I oh, usually yes. winter in West Palm. Um, I have a dressage horse, so I take her down there. And it's a totally different environment. Um, it, it's a very different set of stressors and, and situations that you have to deal with when you get down there into that uh, tr- semi-tropical. Um, yes. You know, which really horses are not a tropical animal. And that's where we run into a lot of issues. Yeah, you run into also quality of hay issues when you get in the south as well. But, yes. I mean, one of the interesting things with, with Wellington was that you probably get better hay in Wellington than you do almost anywhere else in the United States. So there's a lot of and that's there. because you're paying $25 a bale for it. <laughs> so they're bringing in the best yes. from everywhere. We get hay in from Canada. We get hay in from the Midwest. And it's the best hay that they they don't bring in the you know the rough stuff, they bring in the good stuff, and so it's actually easier to get top quality hay in Florida, South Florida, except you you're going to pay. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah, and so let's talk a little bit about the metabolic course that you run into, and and sometimes that can be when you go from being on a poor quality hay, bring them into an area, and all of a sudden now they're getting you know, three quarters rich alfalfa with this and this and this. And all of a sudden there's extra sugar. There's grasses that are growing with all the sunshine. What do you, what, what do you tell your customers as far as, okay, you're, you're having a little bit of metabolic issues. Is there a preventive you like to go through or is there a way to treat? Um, We go through the diet. We take a look at what they're feeding and what the workload is. And the workload is very important um, because a horse that's standing and doing nothing is a totally different animal from the one that's out running, jumping, dressaging, whatever, for an hour plus a day. Um, so you have to you account for what they're currently eating, what they're doing, 
and then you look to see if there's a problem somewhere or if there's some some something's being overfed or something's being underfed. Um, and the metabolic issue is is um, also a function of age. Mm-hmm. Older horses are more likely to be metabolic than younger horses. Um, but yes, there is a big difference. A horse comes in from wherever and it's been eating the local hay and it gets to Wellington and suddenly it's got tip top uh, second cutting Timothy or second cutting orchard grass or with something with 50% alfalfa, the calorie intake is very different. Oh, yeah. You know, you do have to pay attention to that. And, and also the environment is different for them because they, right. uh, they don't get as much turnout. Now they're in box. Big problems with South Florida. It's it's very tight for space, and you know they get this little tiny, not even the size of a dressage arena turnout, and they they there's no grass because it's sand, mm-hmm. and um, lots of horses get an hour or two on this little turnout each day, so there's nothing to eat, and they're bored, and then they don't do anything or they just stand there. Um, it's not like when, you know, Cali, you have those wonderful rolling hills with uh, limestone soil and, you know, horses can gallop up and down the hill. That doesn't happen in South Florida. <laughs> yeah. You don't all have 20, 25 acres to run around on. Right. A farm in South Florida is five acres and they have everything on five acres. I yeah. mean, the house, the barn, the arena, the turnouts. So you can imagine how big those turnouts are. Yeah. Yeah. So your company, you have multiple um, supplements out there. I've noticed for under your products for doing uh, different types of issues that are going on everywhere from digestive, immune, metabolic, muscle support. Talk about some of these supplements that you have and what what makes yours different than what other ones are out there. I know that's a loaded question, but we might as well talk about it. Mine are the best, of course. Of course. The the one, the big one that everybody knows about, of course, is quiescence, which is the magnesium chromium supplement. Mm -hmm. Um, And quiescence came about because all of my supplements really had come about because somebody runs into a problem Mm -hmm. and then they come to me and I think, look at the diet and I say the horse needs whatever. And then we um, find a way to supply it. Um, and the, one of the most common shortfalls in mineral nutrition is magnesium. Uh, magnesium is short for so many animals. You know, we have acid soils. We have um, very high intakes of, of, of starch and sugar. Um, and most of what we're feeding them is low in magnesium. Mm-hmm. So magnesium shortfalls are surprisingly common. Um, and that, so that, that's, that was where we began. That was quiescence. And then we ran into some horses with problems with GI tract function. Um, and that produced the, the supplement we call track guard, which is for the small intestine and stomach to maintain a better pH, get a better environment. So important. Um, muscle support is because we work horses. A horse is an, is an athlete, uh, a performance horse, certainly. And the muscles work hard. And then they're being fed uh, a feed source that maybe doesn't have optimal quality of protein, not quantity. There's plenty of protein in it, but it's not the quality they need. Mm-hmm. So that was where we have the the, meta, the uh, muscle mix and the top line. These are the amino acid supplements. Um, and then we have a few specialized supplements. Balance EQ, which is one for horses that are uh, showing the symptoms of Cushing's disease, and it, it's not going to cure the disease. If I m- must make that clear, Cushing's is incurable. It, it's a deterioration of the of the pituitary, but yep. you can alleviate some of the symptoms by adequate feeding. So mm-hmm. we designed a supplement that would help for those horses, um, and then we have some for behavioral issues where mares have trouble when they cycle, or that kind of thing. Um, and then an immune support system. And, and then, of course, the, the one all, all performance horses have joint issues because they're working hard, they're running, yeah. jumping, they're performing. Um, so we make a couple of joint supplements. Um, and all of these things are done usually in response to somebody needing something. They have okay. a problem of some kind. We come up with a solution. Okay. So if you have somebody come to you and basically they're, they're like, you know, I got a few things, but I'm not going to wood. My horse is pretty solid, but we all know that when we get into actually look at them, there's stuff going on. What do you try to go look at first? Do you try to get like the digestive system working first or you just put them on a general wellness or 
Or... Um, we look and see what they're eating now and okay. have what kind of ration they're on. And then we try to encourage people to think in terms of increasing the forage and decreasing the concentrates. So that's the biggest issue we run into. Um, and part of it is the way the industry is set up. It's a lot easier to go buy a bag of feed from the feed store than to deal with bales of hay. Hay is big and bulky and messy and, and yes. people don't you know, want to have to deal with it. But hay is what they need. So um, you try to encourage people to think in terms of, of forage rather than always concentrate. Right. Um, and then um, you kind of go from there. But the digestive system is, is pretty vital. Um, you know, if they're not digesting and they're running into problems with their GI tract, they're going to be uncomfortable. They're going to express it. Right. So, yes, we probably look at the GI tract before anything else. And that's a lot of things that we do as well. We, we always look at, you know, what's going on. Because if you have an acidic horse or very seldom you have an alkaline horse, you very usually have an acidic horse with right. ulcerations and something else going on and diarrhea and you name it. So getting that system working right first. But talk a little bit about, you know, you, you brought up the part about, you know, they people want to go get the processed food and that's easier than hay. But there's a lot of things to do with how, how food is processed as far as if it's heat processed and losing all the enzymes versus getting rough, real roughage food like they're supposed to get. The um, the, the joy with dealing with horses is that the food is relatively unprocessed. I mean, this is compared to human nutrition. Well, I'm talking um, like pelletized, like they, they feed them a bunch of, you know, hot processed pellets. and Right. Pellets the, and the processing and pellet making is relatively mild. It's mostly grinding, mixing with water, mixing it up, putting it through a steam pelleter, which is cooks it. And then you get a, a pellet comes out at the end. Now, obviously, there has to be a physical change because they have to grind the fiber down. And that in itself has to be accounted for because fiber passes through the GI tract at different rates according to its length. Mm -hmm. So the same hay as a long stem grass hay, when it's chopped as a hay, it's, it passes through faster. And when it's ground to a powder and made into a pellet, it's even faster. So, um, and that doesn't leave it enough time necessarily for the biome and for the enzymes to, to process it as they should. Right. So one of the things we emphasize is the need for long stem hay, meaning yes. relatively unprocessed, basically cut, dried, baled, put in the barn. Um, now there are certain classes of horses who can't handle that. And that's usually a dentition issue. Uh, they can't chew the hay because they, they're old and their teeth are worn down. Then we would have to look at the chopped hays um, and maybe even the pellet, the ground. Um, but the uh, main thing with horses is you need to give them physical long stem hay. Um, and then um, the, the cooking process in horses is, again, relative to human nutrition, pretty mild. I mean, they're just cooked. There's yeah. nothing like the amount of processing that the human nutrition has to deal with. So, um, and cooking has benefits. Um, you do alter the starches, you do alter the um, the protein. You can make them more or less digestible, depending which one they are. Yep. And um, you kill the bacteria that live on the surface so that the feed lasts longer. One of the uh, reasons for cooking food is preservation. Mm -hmm. um, you you know, a horse feed, uh, it, it, it's almost never fresh in the sense that everything in it has been held. I mean, if you're buying something in January, you know that was not grown last week. No. It was grown back in the spring of the year before, and then it was preserved in a silo or in uh, some kind of container. And then it's reprocessed, and then it's made into feed, and then the feed is stored. And the feed is stored in the in the warehouse, and then it's shipped, and then it is stored at the feed store. So a bag of feed bought in January or February is going to have ingredients in it that were grown in April, May, June, the year before. The year before, yes. Um, so you you know you 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 cook for preservation. Pellets definitely keep longer in storage than the same same ingredients made into a what's called a textured feed, a sweet feed. Yeah. Um, that that is a benef benefit. You don't want to be feeding molds. You don't want to be feeding degraded feed. 
Um, but it's a negative in the sense that some of the ingredients are less digestible. Yes. And you have to account for that when you when you rebalance the ration. So some of the people's opinions are, you know, they're foraging. All I need to do is let them be out on grass and give them a handful of whole oats and I'm good for the day. Um, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are certain times of the year when you can do that. Um, right. and, depend, and again, this is very geographical. It's going to depend where you are. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in, let's say, the mid-Atlantic region, you have a spring, a summer, a fall, a winter. The spring and the summer, you don't have to be quite so concerned because there is good grass growth. There's um, adequate minerals in the soil. The grass is pretty nutritious. By the fall, it's starting to drop off. There's certainly lower feed value in the fall grasses unless you're very lucky and have a a lot of late summer rain, in which case you will get some grass growth. Winter, of course, there's nothing and there's probably snow on the ground. So now you're feeding your preserved feedstuffs. If you're in California, it's going to be almost the other way around. Your winter right. is when you get um, grass growth because you have rain. The summer is when the rains don't come and the grass dies back and you're feeding preserved feedstuffs. So, you know, this is geographical um, and that's when you need to be aware of the climate, the prevailing weather and wherever it is you live. Right. right. And so a lot of people, you know, like in our area here, we're in our rainy season starting now. So our grass is growing. So they're like, oh, well, I'll just put the horses out during the day because they think sugars are, are, hard, are worse at night. And there's always this back and forth of, when is the sugar is actually happening? And it's, it's, it's pretty simple if you think about photosynthesis and yeah. growth and when it happens. So I'll let you talk about that. Well, in terms of sugars in the grass, you know, photosynthesis is how the sugars are produced. And photosynthesis requires sunlight. sunlight so mm -hmm. that the grass photosynthesizes during the day in the presence of the sun. And the sugars are highest in the evening. Yes. Overnight, the plant... Um, Resp respires and it consumes some of its sugars. It also puts most of the sugars into storage. Now, how it stores them depends on what kind of plant you're looking at. But the plants are going to be lowest in sugar in the morning and highest mm -hmm. in sugar in the evening. Um, now, how important is that? It's going to depend on your horse. Some horses are very sensitive to sugar. You're going to have to be very careful. Put them out in the morning until midday maybe and then bring them in. Some horses are active and young and don't have sugar sensitivity issues. They can graze all day long. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of individual variation here. And it depends, of course, again, on the workload. Um, horses, young horses that are growing almost never have a sugar problem. I mean, right. every, every calorie they take in is used for growth and development. And so they, they consume as much as they can. Old horses who are not so active and have grown and don't want to grow anymore, um, they are usually the ones you have to limit, be more careful in their management. Right, exactly. Uh, that, that's really good because there's so many people that just say, oh, I only put them out in the late afternoon and in the evening. It's like, no, 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 wrong, wrong time. Unless even, they're a young horse. If they're a young yeah. horse, they can, it doesn't right. matter. Yeah. Or you, or the amount that you introduce them at, the, you know, like around here, the problem is, is that our, you know, our usually our April, May is pretty dry coming off our winter. We, we actually have four seasons down here. Our winter only lasts two weeks, but we, we do have it. Um, and then all of a sudden the rains come and the grass starts growing. And I, I see this spike of where I see, you know, acute laminitis and right. metabolic issues and everything. And it's just like, Take them off the field all day long, put them back on some hay, and a lot of time your problems go away or just limit when they're out on the field. Right. And, the, and with grass, one of the things to remember is that when it's growing fast, it's not absorbing as many minerals um, because right. it's, it's producing tissue as quickly as it can. Um, so grass that is very fresh, very fresh green grass, spring growth surge, that is a little more problematic, and it's because of the mineral levels. It's yeah. not just the sugar. Um, so, again, don't put them out on them on, on that grass. Limit their access. That. Let it get a few weeks old. And when it's got a few weeks old and there's more lignin and more cellulose in the grass, now you're going to limit, slow the intake, 
you're going to l- increase the chewing time and it's going to be much safer to feed. Right. And I was just going to bring that up that a lot of places, especially around here, they love these beautiful short two inch, two to three inch high fields. And mm-hmm. it's like, that's where all the sugars are at. Exactly. If you let it, if you don't mow it any less than five inches and then give them two weeks or a week or so for it to grow, then put them out there. Yes, it doesn't look as nice, but it's so much better for your horse. It's much better for them. Oh, yes. I mean, unfortunately, keeping the pastures beautiful and keeping the pastures safe and productive are almost contradictory. Yes. Um, you can't really do both. Um, the grasses that look nice are not the safest to eat. Yeah, and the horse could then also has choice to move around and eat what they want to eat a little short. They will, then they'll eat some tall or eat this weed over here and a little bit like they're supposed to do. Um, all right. Well, I want to get on another topic I read about in your in your blog, and you have and you have a good blog page. There's a lot of stuff about this kind of information in your blog, so I I recommend a lot of people. But there was the five pound rule. Oh yes, the five pound rule made up by me. No, it, it's uh, it's old traditional horse keeping. Um, you know what you have to remember: the horse has a very small stomach relative to its size. Correct. So it's not going to be big in volume. The other thing is that the horse's stomach is such that only the bottom half of the stomach is protected. The top half is unprotected epithelium. It's like the lining of the esophagus. Mm -hmm. Um, If you put too much food into the horse's stomach at one time, not only do you overfill it, and then it starts pushing the food out into the small intestine more quickly than it should, but also you will raise the level of the contents to the point where they go above the uh, the, the level of the protected epithelium. So you run into more problems if there's too much food present in the stomach in a short period of time. Now, horses love their food. So when you feed them, they eat. I mean, mm-hmm. they eat everything in the bucket. They and love to they eat. <laughs> stop and say, oh, I've eaten enough. I have to stop now. No, that doesn't happen with the horse. So um, you want to limit how much is in any one meal. Um, and the uh, rule of thumb that we were always taught as kids in Pony Club or wherever in England, five pounds. Um, more than five pounds, you're going to start running into problems. So I always recommend to people five pounds is a good good thing. Now, if you have ponies, five pounds is too generous. Yes. If you have draft horses, five pounds, maybe you can get away with a bit more, but you wouldn't be feeding for draft horses that much grain anyway. But you would say to the people, if you you take the daily requirement for the calorie output of the horse and you divide it by five, uh, that gives you how many meals that food has to be split into. So if you're feeding your racehorse 15 to 18 pounds of grain a day, that's a minimum of four meals. Yeah, three to four meals. Yeah, that's great. That's a great tip. Yeah, if it's if you're feeding the horse five pounds of grain a day, then it doesn't matter whether you do one or two meals. Two is better than one, but yes. if you can't do two, one is okay. If you're feeding 10 pounds, you're minimum of two meals, ideally more. Um, so you want to think little and often and um, limit the, the size of the meals. Right. And I want to go back to touch on what you talked about, overfeeding and, and the, the acids that are in the stomach. And a lot of people don't realize that the pH is different from the lower part of the acid to the, or the lower part of the stomach to the middle part of the stomach. And when you overfeed, you're, you're bringing that higher, that pH up. Yeah. Well, that's where the burning of the, of the stomach and the ulcerations happen. Well, the yeah. stomach has hydrochloric acid, just like ours. And it's a pH one to two. Right. It's pretty acidic. Um, and it's the, the horse has, it, horse is a trickle feeder. The horses in nature don't eat meals. They they graze, they gr- stumble around eating almost co- continuously small amounts of high fiber feed. The fiber the sits, floats on the top of the stomach fluids mm-hmm. and acts as a sort of protectant mm-hmm. to um, stop the acid splashing up. The problem, grain doesn't do that. Grain sinks down into the base of the stomach and then yep. the acid comes up. Yeah. So um, if you're feeding hay or forage, it does really doesn't matter. You don't have a five pound rule on forage. Forage you can feed twenty five pounds, and you know yep. they won't eat it fast. Yeah. But if it's grain, if it's something they're going to eat quickly, and if it's solid and heavy, then you're limiting. You have to limit. 
Right. And, and that's yes, you don't want that hydrochloric coming up onto the unprotected parts of the epithelium. And that's, that's where I talk recipe for stomach ulcers. Well, I talked earlier is that, you know, you have these horses that are sitting in a box stall and they're waiting for their two feedings a day and they're stressed and they're creating more body acids, more acids because of that. And, and part of the part, which we didn't talk about much is that the food pulls a lot of these acids through and helps the digestion system through the body as it's going through. Um, People don't realize that the horse is always producing acids in his stomach to help. That's part of them food. being a trickle feeder. Yeah. Um, you know, the horse, horses in humans and dogs, um, acid is produced at meal times or just before meal times, anticipation of eating. It doesn't happen in horses. They, it's a continual production of acid all the time. Right. It time. doesn't change much. There's a little bit more when you, with, with excitement, but it really doesn't change much. It's the same thing with the bile salts from the liver. You know, we have a gallbladder that holds bile salts and releases them when the presence of food. Uh, horses don't. The bile salts enter the small intestine on a continuous basis because the horse is evolved eating continuously. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yes, you don't want to... Um, you know, the horse standing in a box store, particularly if he's not eating forage, if he's not gone hay, he's bored, he's restless. You know, right. when the feed comes, he gobbles it because he's hungry. Um, it would be much better to have that horse on hay and give him less grain. Yeah. And I guess what I was saying is that a lot of times there's six, seven hours before their next feeding time. So you have all that time that the, you know, the acids are being produced and not being pushed through the body. And exactly. So we, we, push, we push slow feeders all the time, you know. that Right. Yeah, slow feeders. Um, and it can be the, the nets with the little tiny holes, or it can be the those physical barrels that have a limit how much they can take at one time. Sure. But slow feeders are very important. If you don't use a slow feeder, you just have to make sure you feed a coarse enough hay that they naturally slow feed. <laughs> right. That's the alternative. So, so, yes, I, I really, tell, uh, you know, you got some great blogs out there about feeding and about watering. Uh, watering is another important thing to, uh, to go along with supplementing because without water, <laughs> horses have well, problems. Water is actually the most important because without water, nothing happens. Right. And animals get very sick and they'll die from dehydration before they die from starvation. So, Correct. yes, they water is very important. Be. They usually have enough body fat on them that they can live longer than they can go without water. All Most right. That, that, that's that's some really cool stuff. So we we do appreciate that. Now, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, and what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Um, go to our website, foxdenequine.com, and um there, there, there's a button on the on the menu for nutritional consult. And you just click that button and you fill in the form. The form is just, you know, email address, name phone number if you want to give it, and then the, your question, your concern, whatever it is you want to know about, um, and those emails come to me, and then I answer them. Okay, and there's, so there's no charge for that consult? No, stuff? they don't charge for nutrition. Okay, well, that's good to know. So people can fill it out. They don't have to worry about that. All of a sudden, I'm going to have a salesperson contact me and try to sell me 25 no. bags of this. We and don't contact. We'd send you back an email with your answer, and sometimes I'll say, let me know how this works out, <laughs> particularly if it's a little bit of a strange question and I had to do some research to find the answer. Um, I'll say, let me know, you know, but no, they won't get a phone call. Awesome. It's awesome. Sounds like they would get some just a wealth of information and probably a lot of their answers from you just by giving you that little little call or fill out that sure. form for you. So I appreciate you. And uh, we've had a great time talking again at the Equine Affair. We, we talked probably more about red light therapy than I did. Right. Because I, I, there isn't very often I get to sit and talk to somebody that knows as much about red light therapy as I knew about. And you really uh, you really uh, helped me out on that as far, as far as having fun. Good. Good. All right. So I want to thank you for being part of this interview. Is there anything else you'd like to add? When I, I like the photonic one that you make because it's small enough to go in my suitcase and I can travel. <laughs> I don't have my, my other lasers are big and bulky and you know, you can't, and you can't get them on an airplane anyway, no. but that little photonic device, it's fantastic because it's battery and I can pack it in my suitcase. And when I get to wherever I'm going, I have my first aid with me in the terms of my photonic device. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, we appreciate that. And again, we want to thank you to be part of this, of the, um, um, of our show today. And uh, we look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you. Right. Don't forget to go to the website if you will have any questions. And that website again is? FoxdenEquine.com. All right. Awesome. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for watching this edition of Photonic Health Presents Health Made Simple. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications for all new Photonic Health videos.